So, so far for this module, we have talked about uh, eukaryotic cells and the different parts of a cell. We've talked about cell membranes and how those are an integral part of cells and how they function. And then most recently, we talked about prokaryotic cells and the parts that make up prokaryotic cells. So today, our topic is going to be viruses. And viruses are interesting because there's actually a debate, and it's ongoing, it will never be resolved, of whether viruses are even living organisms. On one hand, they carry out a lot of the functions of living organisms, like reproduction and uh, metabolism and uh, adaptation, mutation, evolution. However, viruses are not able to do those things by themselves. In order to function and carry on its life cycle, a virus has to be in a, in a host cell, a prokaryotic or a eukaryotic host cell. So viruses are known as obligate parasites. They have to infect and live off of some other organism in order to carry out their life functions. So we're going to start out by exploring virus structure. What do they look like? How are they composed? A little bit about how viruses are uh, classified and then move on to the virus replicative cycle and then talk about uh, some applications of viruses including immunity and vaccination. So a virus itself, the structure is pretty simple. Viruses have basically three parts and really they have two parts and then some of them have a third part. So the three parts of a virus. The first part is a protein coat. Protein coat, and that's technically called a capsid. So the protein coat is called a capsid, and they come in three different flavors. So protein coats are identified by their structure, what they look like, and so you have one type of capsid called an icosahedral, which is a type of geometric pattern. So you have an icosahedral capsid, and then you have helical capsids, which are helix or tube-shaped. So these are tubular. And icosahedral is like a 3D geometric pattern. And then the final one is simply called complex. And so complex has kind of a combination. And ironically, these are the simple vi simplest viruses that do this. So this would be an example of a complex capsid coat. Up here at the top, you have this sort of geometric pattern. This would, if it were just this top part, that would be icosahedral. You have kind of a helical region right here and then some other attachments down here, and so this would be complex. There's no other way to classify it. Usually, the complex viruses are associated with what we call bacteriophages. So complex viruses are uh, viruses that infect then bacteria or other prokaryotes. Again, the icosahedral are things like a geometric pattern. So this is actually a, a model that we put together of an icosahedral capsid. And now notice that this icosahedral capsid is, has different colors on it. There's some pink, there's some yellow and purple, because the way we got that is actually the icosahedral is all made from this piece of paper that's folded up. And then you assemble these into this unique pattern. And that's the way viruses assemble also. So viruses, while they have a capsid, the capsid is made by assembly, assembly of smaller proteins, single individual subunits called capsomeres. Okay? And so you have the capsid made up of capsomeres, and those can be assembled into either an icosahedral, a helical, or a complex pattern. And that's the protein component 
of viruses. The protein coat or the capsid acts as a protective shell uh, around the virus. What is it protecting? It's protecting the genome, that's what we refer to it as, the genome or the nucleic acid component of viruses. All viruses have to have a genome. However, unlike, and, and by the way, all living organisms have to have a genome. In humans, in bacteria, in all other living genome or organisms, the genome is exclusively made out of what we call double-stranded DNA, right? So that's the genetic material in eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells is double-stranded DNA. The nucleic acid found in viruses, at least some viruses, is also double-stranded DNA. So we do see that in viruses. But unlike other organisms, we also see some viruses that have single-stranded DNA as a genome. Still other viruses will have double-stranded RNA as their genome. And then still others have single-stranded RNA. So really, any of those combinations of nucleic acids can be found in different virus types. So that makes them sort of unique. And in fact, this is often what we use to classify viruses. There's a little bit of an addition. So we classify viruses based upon their genome type and the replication process. And so there's actually, it's based on a system developed by uh, Dr. Baltimore called the Baltimore System. It's named after a person, not after the city. And so Dr. Bal Baltimore was a virologist who first came up with this way of classifying the different viruses based on what type of genome they have and then how it's reproduced. Uh, and there's actually seven different types uh, in the Baltimore system, seven different families of viruses. Um, the couple of them. The real variation comes when it comes to single-stranded RNA. There's a couple different families using single-stranded RNA. For humans, although it's hard to say which one is the most common viruses, they're finding a lot of soil bacteria or soil samples that have uh, single-stranded DNA. The most common viruses, when we think of viruses and what makes humans sick or that affect us, it is double-stranded and single-stranded viruses. For example, a double-stranded DNA virus uh, causes the common cold. Single-stranded RNA viruses are also very common. If you've ever heard of HIV before, um, that's a single-stranded RNA virus. Um, so that's the genome. So all viruses have to have a uh, protein capsid and a nucleic acid genome. The third component that viruses can have is an envelope. So you can have a viral envelope. Now, whenever you hear the term envelope, in fact, in an earlier lesson, we heard something called the nuclear envelope that was made. So whenever you see this idea of envelope, envelope refers to a membrane. Okay, so the envelope is a membrane and viruses can actually have an outer membrane. So they have an outer membrane and it's composed then of phospholipids and proteins, just like all membranes. Okay, so you have this outer membrane made out of phospholipids and proteins. The viral envelope is usually stolen from host membrane. And it comes from, depending on the life, the specific life cycle of the virus, that host membrane, it might be coming from the endoplasmic reticulum membrane, uh, sometimes the plasma membrane. Um, each virus might take it and, and process it, develop it a little bit differently. 
but it's stolen from the host, host membrane. And so if this was our capsid with our genome inside, this would be enveloped or covered with some kind of uh, membrane. And the purpose of the membrane a lot of times is to uh, protect that virus from the immune system of its host. So you can think of it, this is the classical uh, wolf in sheep's clothing. So the virus itself is the wolf, and then it encases itself in this plasma membrane from the uh, cell itself. So as it travels through the body to infect the next cell, it's actually looking like it's another cell because it's grabbed this, it's encased itself in this plasma membrane envelope, so to speak. And so it has a lot of the host proteins on the top. And uh, so it looks like another cell from that organism. However, just like uh, I think it's in uh, Little Red Riding Hood where the wolf dresses up like grandma and is hiding, it can't do so completely. So it can encapsulate itself in the sheep's clothing, but it can't totally cover itself. There's still ways uh, of knowing it because it has to have on the outside it still has to have, still has viral, what we call glycoproteins exposed in that. It has to insert its own proteins in the surface of that envelope so that it can recognize its host cell again and infect another host cell. So even though it mostly looks like sheep, you can still see like the wolf ears and the wolf tail, I guess, might be a good analogy of that. It can't totally hide in the envelope. Another interesting feature, even though the viral envelope actually protects it inside of a host organism and, and keeps it safer, if you will, for whatever reason, we find that viral envelope viruses, viruses that have an envelope, tend to be less hardy outside of the body. So even though it helps them, it serves as protection inside of the host body, envelope viruses are a little bit weaker outside of the host body, probably because that envelope is necessary for infection, but it's susceptible to drying out and other environmental conditions. So it breaks down easily. So that's the third component. There is another fourth component that some viruses have, and that's called accessory proteins. So some viruses, part of their life cycle, requires additional proteins. that help in a particular virus's life cycle. So the classic example of an accessory protein, we talked earlier about a virus called HIV. So, and this is known in the news a lot, human immunodeficiency virus. And HIV belongs to a category called retroviruses. And what retroviruses are, do is they have single-stranded RNA, that's their genome, and when they infect a cell, they have to take that single-stranded uh, RNA and they have to copy it to make a double-stranded DNA. And that then inserts in the host genome DNA, actually, and hides out there. So retroviruses have to take an RNA template and make it into DNA. Now we already know we have a term when you take DNA and make it into an RNA molecule, a DNA template creating an RNA molecule, we call that transcription. When we take RNA and make a DNA molecule out of it, we call that reverse transcription because we're going in the opposite direction. And reverse transcription requires an enzyme called this hopefully makes sense to you, reverse transcriptase. And reverse transcriptase is a classical example of an accessory protein. 
The hosts, like our cells, my cells and your cells, do not carry reverse transcriptase at all. We have no need for it. We never would want to make RNA into DNA. So we don't have that. That means that when the virus infects a new host, it has to carry reverse transcriptase with it inside the capsid so that when it infects, it has that enzyme already in there and can start the reverse transcription process. So it has to carry that. It then will make additional copies of reverse transcriptase and package them into the new virus particles that are made so they can also be infectious. If a cell, if a, sorry, if a virus does not uh, package reverse, a copy of the reverse transcriptase in its capsid, then that cell will not work when it, or that virus will not work when it infects a new cell. And so that's an example of an accessory protein. Other accessory proteins, um, they're usually unique to the cell, to the virus life cycle. So there are some viruses that have to carry special hydrolytic enzymes to break down the cell wall or that have to carry it to release them out of a cell. Uh, during the final stages of their life cycle. So there's just certain accessory proteins that have to be carried with the virus. So those are the different components in the structure of a virus. Uh, let's, oh, let's come back here. One more element of the capsid. You have, we said that you had capsimeres. There's also another element of the capsid, and we'll draw this in a structure in a second. But they're often referred to as spike proteins. And so spike proteins are the proteins on the surface that are responsible for host cell identification. And what we mean by that, we said viruses are obligate parasites, so they have to infect another cell. But viruses are also very specific for their host. So you can have viruses that will infect a human cell, but leave dog cells or cat cells or any other animal totally alone. They will only infect human cells. Other viruses will not only only infect human cells, but they'll only infect a special type of human cell. So maybe one type of, uh, for example, HIV infects one cell type in the immune system of humans. And it doesn't infect any other kinds of cells. You could spray it all over dogs and have no effect on them. Okay? Uh, so they can be very specific. And the reason for that is these spike proteins are sort of receptors on the surface of that capsin. And they're responsible for making, for identifying some kind of protein on the surface of the host cell that serves as an anchor that allows that virus to come down and recognize that and attach to it and anchor to that host cell and that starts the infection process. And so that is a function of those spike proteins. So now we've been talking about this. Let's erase some of this and see if we can draw a virus with its component parts. So we'll start and I'll make this so in purple We'll label this. So this purple right here, this is going to be the capsid. So my proteins are purple. Right here, this individual circle, that would be an individual capsomere. So the capsid is made by assembling these individual capsomeres into a larger structure, just as we show, showed earlier with our model. And then on the surface, you would have, at regular intervals, this would be the spike proteins. So if this was a naked virus, it wouldn't have an envelope. You'd have the spike proteins connected directly to the capsid. And so there would be 
spike proteins at different intervals. And then inside here, this capsule would be protecting, uh, we'll make this one a double-stranded DNA. Double-stranded DNA. And so that's protecting the genome. Now, if this were an envelope virus, then the spike proteins wouldn't be on the capsid because the envelope would cover them up. So if this were an envelope virus, then we would have the membrane that would surround it. So this would be the phospholipid bilayer. That would form the envelope. So this would be the envelope, which is a phospholipid bilayer. And now we would have to take those spike proteins and they would have to be embedded now in the outer area that would contact the host cell. So the spike proteins would now be embedded in that enveloped uh, layer. You'll often hear these, so when we talk about these, they're, they're serving the same function as the spike proteins, but when it's part of an envelope, you often hear these called glycoproteins, or if particularly there'll be a V in front of it to call it a viral glycoprotein. Okay? But they're serving the same function of host identification, and so that would be the different parts of a virus and what it would look like. Over here... We said that viruses are primarily classified by their DNA or by their genome, and that's correct. You will also see, though, viruses classified by their uh, capsid type. And there's really four types in that sense of capsid types. So you have, we already went over these, icosahedral, and you have helical viruses, and you have complex viruses, and then the fourth category would be an enveloped virus. They just say, okay, that's an enveloped virus, that's the outer surface, and then inside would be one of those capsid types, but it's still classified as an enveloped virus in the fourth category when you uh, categorize them that way. Okay, so coming back over here, we've talked a little bit about virus structure. We've talked a little bit about virus classification. So main classification is by genome type and uh, the replication process. You can also start to classify viruses by their capsid and whether they're enveloped or not. Sometimes viruses are often named um, with their host in mind, so human immunodeficiency virus. Um, that's how they're often named, although they're not usually classified that way. Now, Let's go on to talk about the virus replicative cycle. A little bit of introduction to this particular topic and some terms that come up a lot with it and we have to clarify. Uh, when we first started identifying viruses, well, viruses, because they were, they're so small, you can hardly even see them in a microscope, even an electron microscope. Um, they're so small, we didn't even realize they were around for a while. We suspected that they were causing infections, but it took us a while to really be able to uh, identify them and study them. And one of the easiest places to look at how a virus reproduces is in bacteria. So bacteria were the host. And then the virus that we first learned about bacterial li or viral life cycles were called bacteriophages, or some people call them uh, bacteriophages, or just phage or phage. Um, either one, I've heard it pronounced phage and phage either way. And that was the virus that they used. 
And if you think about it, it makes sense. In order to study the virus life cycle, they had to be able to um, watch the virus uh, grow and reproduce and then infect a new organism and grow and reproduce. And so it would have been hard to do that, to study, to actually go out and say, if we were using humans, you'd have to infect humans and get them sick and then try and isolate the viruses and then infect another human. And that's generally considered to be unethical to do that. Uh, and so it was much easier to study how viruses infect bacteria because in the lab you could keep your, your whole environment was just a petri plate. You could grow up large quantities of uh, phages, infect bacteria. No one got upset when you killed millions upon trillions of bacteria. And so it was really easy to study in these systems. Now, when they were studying this, they first started to study it. And they immediately began to notice that there were two responses to phages. So they identified two uh, phage types. So they had what they would call temperate phages. And then they had virulent phages. So temperate and virulent were adjectives that they used to describe or classify the phages themselves. And this is the way it would work. They would grow up a plate of, or they take a, a tube of bacteria, and then they take some phages and they mix it inside of that tube. They shake it and then they spread it out on a plate. And one of two things would happen. When they come back the next day, they would see the whole plate would just be dead. The virus had immediately gone in and killed off all of the bacteria. And that was referred to as a virulent phage. Uh, virulent means potent or powerful. And they said, man, that must be a pretty powerful phage. It's killing off all the bacteria. The other response, so temperate, remember temperate means mild. If you live in a temperate climate, it's mild. It's not as powerful. So temperate means mild. And in a temperate phage, what would happen, they'd mix a temperate phage, and they come in the next morning, and the bacterial plate would be fine. It didn't look like there was any problems at all. And so then they would take that plate, and they would kind of keep growing it for a while. And then something would happen, and <laughs> the plate would wipe out. But it took a lot longer for that to happen. So the virus would still act on the bacteria. It would still kill them off. But it seemed like it was milder, like it, it didn't kill them off as well. And so those were the two, what we call two phenotypes that they would observe. Temperate wouldn't seem to kill them off immediately, and virulent would kill them off immediately. As they started to look at these life cycles, or, or what happened in these different bacteria, that's when they started to describe life cycles. And they discovered that the temperate phages undergo what we call a lysogenic life cycle. And virulent phages undergo what we call a lytic life cycle. So the correct terms for describing phages are temperate and virulent. Life cycle is lysogenic and lytic. Uh, that said, there are often people who will talk about a uh, lytic phage, even though that's technically not a thing, okay? Meaning that it's a phage or a, a virus, let's call it a lytic virus or a lysogenic virus. That refers to the life cycle and not necessarily to phages. So, what did they discover? Let's go through and talk about the lytic life cycle first because it's actually the simpler uh, life cycle. So the lytic life cycle has five stages or five steps to it. And the first step is called attachment. And attachment is going to involve, remember we talked about those spike proteins on the surface and host identification. Okay, so attachment involves host identification by the spike proteins. So 
if we were to draw so this is my I'll label this this is my bacteria and so you have some kind of receptor or protein on the surface of that bacteria. In fact, maybe I'll draw those are going to be purple. So you have some kind of surface protein and then the virus, in this case, the, uh, we're talking about bacteriophages, so they're typically complex uh, structures. So you have these tail fibers that are designed to attach to and recognize. So in this case, in a complex virus, those are the spikes. And then up here, you would have the genome packaged in the capsid up there. And so the first step, step one, is that that virus is going to attach to the bacterial, to the host surface using the spike proteins. And that's what attachment is. So if it has the right receptors on here that the spike proteins identify it, then it will attach. If it doesn't, if it doesn't have the right receptors, purple receptors on here, then the virus will ignore it and try and look for its true host somewhere else. So that's attachment. The next stage is called entry. So in entry, we're really looking at the genome. So the genome somehow has to enter the cell. In this case, these complex viruses have kind of a unique method. When they land on the spike proteins, it causes a conformational shift in this. And this coil right here ends up landing. And there's, a, there's a kind of a needle point up here. And it lands on here. And it actually injects the DNA like a hypodermic needle into the cell. And then the, the capsid part actually stays outside the cell. So it just the DNA flows through this tube. It pierces. Um, the membrane, and then the DNA just flows right into the cell. And so now, too, we have the genome. So now we have the viral genome inside of the bacterial cell. And that's stage two. That's entry. Stage three. We now have the viral genome inside the cell, and we have what's called synthesis. Synthesis is the creation of new viral genomes and proteins using host machinery. So remember, to make a protein, you need to make RNA, you need ribosomes. Well, the virus doesn't have ribosomes and it doesn't have polymerases, so it's going to use the host polymerases and ribosomes. And so what happens is you get parts. So it uses the DNA, it makes, so 3A, it starts to make copies of the viral genome. And then it also starts to make copies of, I'll try and make this look like the viral protein parts. OK, that's supposed to look like the different protein parts. So this would be 3B right there. So we're going to synthesize new genomes, and new capsids, basically. That's what synthesis is. What are we going to use to do that? Well, we're going to use the proteins, the ribosomes and polymerases. And I'm writing these in purple because that's uh, 
because they're coming from the purple bacteria. So you've got ribosomes and polymerases that are being used. So now we have the parts. That's what synthesis is. And in the fourth step, we have what's called assembly. We've got them in the raw form, but we need to package, we need to take that nucleic acid, and we need to build the capsid around it. So we need now to build our virus, and that's what assembly is, is we are packaging the capsid, the viral capsid, around the genome. And I'm not going to be able to draw this real well, but basically um, what often happens is a single genome will act as an uh, assembly site and attract the different proteins to it, and they'll just sort of build right around the genome. Okay? And that's what causes them to assemble. The genome is actually what causes the uh, virus to start to assemble together. So that's the fourth step, assembly. And then the fifth step is simply called release or exit. So new virus particles release from the host. And this is what kills the host. I mean, none of this other stuff, when, when you start taking over all the polymerases and ribosomes, that's not good for the host cell. But uh, it's when the virus actually breaks forth, so you build, oh, I don't know, it might be a dozen to a score to a couple score virus particles in here. It starts to swell, and eventually it just ruptures the plasma membrane. And now you have all these new infectious particles that are released, and then they go infect and start their life cycle all over again. So that's the viral life cycle. And that's why these virulent phages, it was, it was immediately killing off the host cell, and that's why you didn't see any bacteria on the plate in the morning. Release varies from host to host. Sometimes they just grow so big they burst out of it. They just burst the uh, plasma membrane. Um, Others of them will use enzymes. They have special enzymes that they create that will eat through the plasma membrane and the cell wall to help the viruses release. So it varies from virus to virus on how they do that. How they accomplish, uh, for example, even entry varies from virus to virus. Okay? We saw in this case it was injecting. Other viruses will come up and induce uh, endocytosis, so they'll induce the cell to bring it inside and go through the lysosome. Um, other viruses will chew a hole through the plasma membrane and bring the whole capsid inside. So they just vary in how they accomplish entry. That's the lytic life cycle. The lysogenic cycle is similar, but has a couple of additional steps. So let's erase this. and use some different colors. So now we're going to draw a red bacteria. That's our host. So that's our bacterial host. And we'll have a green virus. This one's going to look a little bit the same. And we'll erase this part. And change this from lytic to now lysogenic. OK. So in the lysogenic life cycle, it actually starts the same way. We're going to have attachment. It, it initiates with attachment. You have entry. So the genome has to enter into the cell. 
So we have step one, and then step two, uh, the, you have the genome enter into the cell. Step three, though, becomes different. In step three, so right here you have, I'm going to draw this, is going to be the bacterial DNA. So it's got a circular, large circular chromosome. And what happens is step three is different. Step three is integration. And what we mean by integration is the virus actually sends in, it has an accessory protein that actually ends up cutting the bacterial genome and it makes some space for it and then it splices in its own DNA. So that's the viral DNA and so it splices its own DNA into the bacterial genome. And the spliced DNA is what is referred to as a prophage or if this were an animal cell with an animal virus, then it would be called a provirus. Okay? Um, pro meaning before the virus. And so that's what integration is. We're going to insert the viral DNA into the bacterial genome. Now, why is this a big deal? The bacteria, this doesn't affect the bacteria at all so far. The bacteria is going to start reproducing. So the bacteria will divide. One cell becomes two. But every time that bacterial cell divides, what does it also copy and divide? The virus DNA. So every time the bacteria divides, it's also copying and reproducing the virus DNA. And that goes on. This is why the plates under the temperate phages, they come back in the morning and be full of bacteria. They were all growing. They seemed healthy. They were doing well. But at some point, Usually due to environmental factors, you get expression. Expression of the prophage or provirus. And so what happens then is, for whatever reason, usually what happens is there will be some kind of environmental factor that hits this bacterial cell. So you have some kind of environmental component. This might be um, starvation. So sometimes if the bacteria gets overcrowded and starts to starve, it will influence the virus. Sometimes it can be just sunlight or some kind of stress situation. And it causes this uh, prophage to reactivate. And so then the prophage, so this was step three, the prophage will come out and it expresses that genome and then you go back into, so step five here, now you go back into synthesis, which we already talked about. So we're now making new viral uh, genome copies, new viral protein copies, that proceeds right into assembly and then release again. In black, we have the steps of the lytic life cycle. In red, we have the two additional steps now that define the lysogenic life cycle. So it's this uh, integration into the host genome and then the expression out of that host genome. Okay. Now this is why the plates then, once you got through with them, they'd grow for several days, everything would be fine. Then they'd hit some kind of environmental condition that turned on that prophage, expression would happen, and then whoosh, it would wipe out the whole plate in one fell swoop because every bacteria in that was carrying that prophage, that virus, due to the early uh, infection. And so that's the lysogenic life cycle. These life cycles were first described using phages, but we also find that animal viruses uses variations of this. For example, do we have 
uh, vi animal viruses with lysogenic life cycles? Yes. Um, a variation of it occurs in uh, herpes virus, which is a virus responsible for uh, cold sores. So if you've ever had a cold sore, and they're actually quite common, um, the, the virus goes lysogenic in that it enters, the D when you get infected with a cold sore with herpes virus, it actually enters into the DNA of certain nerve cells. And then environmental conditions like stress or sunlight, you may have noticed that if you do happen to get cold sores, they are in response. A lot of times they'll come when you're either really stressed or maybe it's, uh, you've, it's been a long winter and you start going outside for the first time and you get exposed to a lot of sunlight and then you'll have a cold sore develop. What's happening is that uh, provirus is activating, creating viral particles that then form the cold sore and you're looking at the assembly and release of those virus particles. In this case, they're not actually killing that nerve cell. They release through um, exocytosis. They release new virus particles through exocytosis. And they'll, they'll be active for a while, and then they'll go dormant and go back into the provirus stage until they're reactivated. And so that's the way the herpes virus works. So you never really cure yourself of the, of the herpes virus. That's why you keep getting cold sores time after time, and that those cold sores will often come at the same location or the same place that you've had them before, because that infected nerve cell is still there. So that's the lytic cycle and the uh, lysogenic life cycle and how they apply. The last thing I'd like to talk to you about is a little bit about how we then deal with viruses and fight them off. So, viruses and disease and immunity and vaccination. That's a lot for one topic. Okay, so viruses cause disease. We're done, <laughs> okay? Um, viruses will infect cells and then they cause uh, disease. If you think about it, and, and some of the viruses, um, a lot of times we think a really nasty virus is one that infects a cell and then kills it off quickly. That's not a nasty virus, that's a dumb virus. Because what happens is if that virus infects that cell and kills off its host quickly, that means that that virus, that host, doesn't have much time to spread that virus around to new hosts. So if a virus acts too quickly and kills a host is really virulent, um, that's usually a very immature, we call it, or a newly formed virus. Um, it's not very smart if you're a virus to kill off your host because then you can't spread to new hosts. Really devious viruses. If you want a devious, if you want a nasty virus, look at HIV. HIV will infect an individual, and they can go for a period of time not even knowing that they're infected. And actually, it doesn't um, kill off the host for a long time. In fact, HIV never really kills its host. What happens is HIV kills off the immune system of the host. So the very thing that would attack the HIV and kill it off, it knocks off um, right at the beginning. So now that host has no immune system, which means the virus is basically free to run throughout the entire body. And then it doesn't kill off the host, though. Killing off your immune system doesn't kill you. So that host is walking around and talking and able to spread the virus to all sorts of other hosts. What finally kills that host is because the immune system is knocked out, some other virus or disease will come in and kill that host. So HIV is an example of a really developed nasty virus. Um, because, again, it has a long uh, exposure time where that host can spread that virus uh, to other hosts. One of the things about viruses, so uh, viruses are actually really hard to treat. Um, early on, in the early 1900s, uh, a lot of people would die from different dis infectious diseases. Um, and while there's multiple um, causes of infectious diseases. The two main ones are bacteria, bacterial parasites, and viral parasites. 
Well, early in the 1900s, around World War I, we started to uh, find a class of drugs called antibiotics. And antibiotics kill bacteria, and they work really well at it. And they kill bacteria by focusing on parts of the bacteria that are different from eukaryotic cells. And so, for example, we talked earlier about how prokaryotes have different ribosomes than eukaryotes do. And so there are certain drugs that will knock out the prokaryotic ribosome without affecting the eukaryotic ribosome. And this is the idea, right? We can kill off the bacteria without killing off our cells. And there's also, we, we target some other drugs, target the uh, cell wall of bacteria. Well, our cells don't have a cell wall. So a drug that affects cell wall development won't hurt us at all. And so we can take them, and it doesn't bother us, but it does kill off the bacteria. And that's the idea of a good drug. The challenge that we have in, with viruses is viruses in their life cycle are using our proteins. So if we were to design a drug that would knock out the viral life cycle, the proteins involved with the viral life cycle, that also knocks out our proteins. And so any, any not any drug, but many of the drugs that will work at killing off viruses in their life cycle are also going to kill us off. And that's not a good thing. So developing drugs against viruses is actually really hard to do. It's only been in the last, oh, I guess it's about two decades now, decade to two decades, that we've started to come up with some good antiviral medications. And even those don't work great. There are some, and, and partially that's because if you develop a medicine against a virus, viruses, they're very small, and they reproduce very quickly, and so they evolve very quickly. So if you come up with an antiviral drug, it's often difficult um, to keep it because a virus will mutate against it so quickly. So let's write some notes up here then. So um, first of all, and this is a common misconception, Antibiotics kill bacteria, not viruses. But we think we go in and we get a cold or, or we start getting a runny nose, stuffy head, or our stomach feels sick, we go into the doctor, and it could be one of two things. It could be a virus, it could be a bacteria. If it's a bacteria, antibiotics will work great. But if it's a virus, it won't work at all. And so, um, antibiotics kill bacteria, not viruses. Antivirals, antiviral drugs, are hard to find. Why are they hard to find? Because Because most of the targets for the virus life cycle are eukaryotic. And so if they kill the virus, they'll also kill us. So, and then the second reason they're hard to find is because rapid evolution in viruses adapts um, resistance to drugs quickly. As an example, the second one, um, when they were first starting to develop uh, antivirals, a lot of the research came out of uh, HIV and trying to find a cure for HIV. So HIV was spreading, uh, particularly through the uh, gay population in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And that was a, a culturally sensitive population. So there was a lot of research money that was put into HIV research. Um, and they started to find some drugs. And so they would give an HIV patient uh, a, this drug, and it would clear their system from HIV particles. So you could test their blood, and there'd be no HIV particles on it. You can't really cure HIV because it's a retrovirus. It integrates lysogenic. It integrates into the DNA. So unless you get rid of all the cells um, that it infects, you're still going to have some infectious 
are potential for infection, but it would clear the body of live particles. You couldn't detect the HIV in these individuals on the drug. But then after a short period of a couple months, then it would. You'd start to be able to see that uh, viral count come up, back up again and they would become uh, infectious. What was happening is the virus was developing an immunity, a resistance to that drug over time um, because it was just evolving and adapting. So now what they do, they got clever about it, and now if you have HIV, if you can afford them, they give you a cocktail of about three different drugs. And so it turns out that a virus can only kind of evolve against one immunity or one resistance at a time. So if you evolve against one of the drugs, the other two drugs are going to kill you or tamp down that virus. And so if you use a cocktail of drugs, then it's, it's difficult. I won't say impossible, but it's very difficult for that, uh, for that virus to adapt to that particular drug cocktail. We said before it was hard to find targets. They are now finding targets. So what would you use if you wanted to develop a new antiviral drug? You have to target proteins that are unique to the virus. So targets now, we're learning a lot more about the specifics of viral life cycles. So we're often targeting accessory proteins. So if a virus has accessory proteins, um, or specific ones that it, it needs to function, those are the proteins that we're going to try and target with new drugs. And so that's how antivirals work. Antiviral drug development is still probably in its infancy. They have some drugs out on the market. They're fairly expensive against things like the common cold, right? And so you can go get antivirals. They're expensive. They don't really get rid of the virus, but they will decrease the symptoms and they will uh, cause you to uh, heal or, or um, get better uh, from that viral infection, that common cold, more quickly. But they don't eliminate it. About the only thing we've seen so far that works really well against viruses is your immune system. So, kind of like an arms race, we said viruses will evolve quickly. Well, guess what? We have an immune system that also evolves quickly. And so, your best defense against viruses is actually your own immune system. And so, the immune system works So, here's uh, Here's you. And the way that your immune system works, you have what's called an adaptive immune system. And inside your body, uh, you have a type of cell called a B cell. Okay, and the B cell, you guys may have heard this term before. This B cell has on it, on the surface of it, it has a special type of protein called antibodies. An antibody is a Y shaped protein, so it looks like this, and then it has what we call a variable region. So this little cup region on here is designed to recognize uh, different um, ligands or um, uh, antigens. And an antigen is just simply some foreign body that comes into cell. It could be a virus, it could be a part of a virus, it could be a bacteria, it could be a uh, pollen. This is how you develop allergies and things. So the antigen is just some kind of foreign molecule or body that comes into the cell. Now, your body is, can be hit by hundreds of thousands of different antigens um, during a year or whatever it might be. 
you're, you have, you're exposed to a lot of different foreign bodies, whether it's pollen, viruses, bacteria, uh, a splinter, if you get wood splinter in your finger. All of these are foreign bodies that are entering into your body. And there's no way for your body, your immune system, to know what's going to hit it at any given time. So the way it deals with that is this area in the antibody is called the variable region. And each B cell, as it's being trained, goes through this genetic mutation process where it creates a different antibody. So you have literally millions of different B cells in your body, but each one has its own unique antibody that's designed, the variable region is kind of like a hand with fingers, and, and different combinations or shapes of those fingers to, uh, to create a different antibody. So you have millions of different antibodies, um, each one with its own unique B cell. And so what happens in your body is you will have some kind of virus that comes in, and it's quite likely that somewhere in your body a uh, B cell exists that has an antibody that will match and recognize that virus as an antigen. When the B cell recognizes the virus, so when the right B cell identifies its antigen, then that B cell clones itself. And you start to get a response. So two things are happening. The virus invades your body. It immediately starts to infect cells, and it's going to go through its viral life cycle, and it starts re reproducing viruses. So you get more viruses happening in your body, and so you start to get the symptoms of being sick. Once the right B cell finds its viral antigen, then it starts to clone itself, and you start to create, like Star Wars, a clone army of that B cell that attacks it. The B cells can grab the viruses, and they'll actually end up killing the viruses. They do a couple things to it. They grab it, and they take all the viruses. Each antibody on the surface can grab a virus, and they kind of hold it and keep it from attacking cells. So it acts as like a strain or a sieve, or grabs them all and keeps them from moving around and entering new cells. It also, when it binds the virus, not only does it weaken it, but it targets it for another type of blood cell called macrophages um, to come in and they recognize the antibodies and then they swallow the virus and destroy it. So B cells are the army against the viruses. And what's going to happen is if we can find the right B cell, but remember there's only like one or two of these in your whole body that might recognize or be programmed against that virus. And so it takes a while. You've got to get a lot of copies of the virus being spread out before you find this, uh, the right B cell, and it takes a while to clone itself and then fight it. So when you get sick, the virus spreads first. Then a B cell comes in, identifies it. The B cell clones itself. The virus has got a head start, and so you're getting all these symptoms and sickness, and then you get better because now the B cell comes in and wipes things out. And, and takes over the virus, and that's why you get better. What happens, what's interesting though, once this B cell kills off the virus, then the clone army kind of dies off. It gets rid of itself, it's no longer needed, you don't want to support that many um, cells. However, it retains, instead of now having just one or two of that B cell, it retains I don't know, kind of like a National Guard unit. So instead of just having one or two, it retains maybe 100 or 1,000 of that type of B cell. And they're going to be spread all over the body. So now, when you get the second infection comes in, so now you have virus, and this is the second exposure of it, you now already have a bunch of B cells that recognize it posted throughout the body. So as soon as this virus comes in, the chances are much higher that the right B cell recognizes it, develops a small clone army, and takes the virus out before you even know you get sick. And that's called an adaptive immune system. 
So when you get exposed to a virus, there's really this arms race going on. The virus itself is trying to replicate and reproduce itself before it gets caught by the B cell army. And that's why if you, if you get better, the B cells won. And if you don't get better or you die, then the virus won. And you didn't recognize it quick enough and it, it overwhelmed your immune system and killed you. And that's the way virus infections go. So you have some, so particularly virulent viruses, things are very, very, very nasty viruses. Um, and how do you, def uh, there's some that cause um, damage, like typhoid or, um, and I'm trying to think of some really bad virus, like polio was one. And I say was because we mostly eradicated polio. Now, and we did it through a process called vaccination. And vaccination receives a lot of heat today, but let's talk about the process a little bit and where it comes from. So vaccination is a process where instead of exposing someone to a virus, so we said, look, you can have this first exposure to a virus and then you develop the National Guard, the B-cell National Guard, to fight against a second exposure. Um, well, what if, instead of introducing an actual live virus, what if we just introduce some partial or weakened virus? So what they do is they would take a virus and initially they would kill it off with heat. So you just had, that's supposed to be a dead virus. So you kill off the virus with heat or some other chemical means to kill it off, and then you inject the dead virus into the host. That's what uh, vaccination essentially is. You take some kind of dead or attenuated, or sometimes they just use virus parts. They'll just take some capsid proteins, not a live virus, and they'll inject it into the host organism. That is sufficient. That dead virus will initiate the B cell clone army. But there's no race because this isn't infectious. It's not going to hurt you, but it does or it can initiate cloning of the B cell army. And so you develop the National Guard even though you never develop the disease. That's the idea behind vaccination. So now your B cell army, if you will, is already programmed and prepared to face that particular virus even though it's never really seen the real thing. So now you get hit, there's still, there might be polio virus out there. So you guys, most of you, hopefully all of you, have been vaccinated against polio. So you've gotten the vaccine, you've got a B cell army against polio. So now you get introduced to the polio virus going over to your roommate's uh, room or, or something, it immediately gets killed. You'll develop no symptoms, it's done, you never see it. Um, some other ones, a really bad one, in fact this is where vaccination first came from, there was a really bad virus called smallpox. And smallpox has a very high mortality rate um, and so it would kill off a lot of people. And the very first vaccination was in England by uh, a guy named uh, Jenner, Dr. Jenner I believe. And he, he was worried about the smallpox epidemic and he noticed that there was a similar um, disease to smallpox had some of the similar symptoms called cowpox but cowpox was almost never fatal to its host so you could get cowpox and survive but if you got smallpox you would die and um, he noticed that uh, patients who had been exposed to cowpox early in life um, would would be able to survive smallpox for whatever reason, if you had smallpox when you were young and then you got exposed, sorry, if you had cowpox when you were young and then got exposed to smallpox, you would resist it. You would live. Uh, you would be one of the survivors of smallpox. And so he got this idea. He took, you, you couldn't do this today. It'd be really unethical. But he took um, a small boy um, and he took uh, cowpox and he inoculated him with cowpox. And so we gave him cowpox intentionally. By the way, that's not the bad part. Like moms, when, when chicken pox goes through the area, your mom's always, my mom would send me to play with someone that had chicken pox, so then I'd get chicken pox, and then we'd get it all through in one fell sweep in the house. So the idea isn't that uncommon. 
Um, but so he infected the young boy with cowpox, and then this was the unethical part. Then he took that young boy and he exposed him to smallpox, and and that was the bad part because he thought you know he's going to survive. Well, yeah, but if he wouldn't have survived, that would have been really bad. But good news is he did survive. And uh, so that was the first vaccination, and that led to the theory of vaccination. In fact, vaccination, uh, vaca, is the Latin root for cow. And so when you vaccinate someone, you are literally um, cowing them. And it comes from the idea of cowpox and that first inoculation with cowpox. And that's where the word vaccination comes from. And so vaccination, when you talk about being able to protect against viruses and uh, overcome them, your own immune system and the process of training that immune system through vaccination is really the most effective means of fighting viruses that we have. Um, drugs are still in their infancy. Um, really, when you get sick with a virus, it's your immune system that is going to get you better. And vaccinations are helping to, um, to train that immune system and allow them to do, do their job better and fight that war better without you getting sick. So that is immunity and vaccination. And that is our discussion on viruses.